would like to um, start our first session. Morgan Bazilian will be moderating if you would all come up. And uh, remember, the bios are in the printed program, the event app, and on the website. If you have any questions, we'll have a microphone that'll rove uh, when you open it up, if Morgan does, or he'll have some questions. And um, we will get started. So please welcome this panel and Morgan Bazilian. Wow, that was, that was incredibly efficient. Um, good morning, everybody. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, of course, uh, following Governor Ritter is a, is a tough act to follow, and I don't have uh, extraordinary uh, boots on, but I do have uh, sort of fancy socks on, which I hope is a, which is a good enough substitute. Um, so uh, my name is Morgan Bazilian. I'm, uh, I just started at the Colorado School of Mines about a year ago. So in academic terms, that's uh, yesterday as they operate in three-year time horizons. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple uh, opening remarks and then we have an extraordinary panel. Um, so could I have those slides go up? Or are they up? Oh, there they are. So um, we're starting a, a, a new institute uh, called the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the School of Mines. The idea is to connect the science, math, and engineering strength of the university with public policy or context or the rest of the world. And this panel is about the rest of the world, so that seems appropriate. Um, we did a quick look at about 35 other energy and natural resources institutes in the United States and Europe uh, to get an idea of what we might want to do. And I, I would say, I don't know if Brian Wilson is in the audience, but um, uh, that, I, that I thought that the institute at CSU was perhaps uh, one of the finest or the finest in the country. Um, so we're standing up a new institute. We have, uh, 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 the website is up and running. You're, you're welcome to come take a look. Um, we're putting out content, we're doing branding, we're doing fundraising, all the normal things, and of course, writing papers, which is, uh, what academics love to do. And we are also starting uh, some, some partnerships uh, here in Colorado, but also um, across the country and globally that I'm, uh, I'm really proud of and excited about. And, and the thing that, we're, that we've uh, launched just recently is something called an Earth Observation Group. So the group that used to be working at NASA, NOAA, is now working with us on um, satellite imagery from a NASA satellites and they can see things like lights at night, they can see gas flaring, they can see fishing boats globally and their, their work is, is uh, supported and used uh, all around the world. So we're, we're proud of that and they, they have a new uh, website up, you can, you can find it through our website. So as far as today, um, we have four uh, terrific panelists, you can see most of their bios in the book, uh, I'm not sure if Amy's is in there yet. Um, Dan Kamen was unable to make it. He was called to Spain to go see Obama. That was the, <laughs> that was the explanation I got. So I'm not sure what that means exactly, if it was golf or something else. But um, uh, in any case, Amy is, 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 a, is a much better person to have up here in, in, anyway. Um, so the, the, the rest of the... Um, the, the rest of the conference, or a lot of the conference to, to date, a, a, as Governor Ritter uh, has, has said, is it, it's been largely domestically focused and even focused on Colorado more, more uh, tightly. It's, it, there's been a lot of discussion, I think, because of the sponsorship, but also because of the people in the room around the electricity market. Uh, and, and the, the exciting things happening in Colorado and electricity. And so we decided with this panel we would, we would take the exact opposite uh, uh, perspective. So we're going to look at the global system. We're going to have zero focus on uh, uh, Colorado. We're not going to have a focus on uh, even North America, as far as I know. Um, so I, I usually put this up for context. Uh, all of you are energy experts, and, and you know these things, but this lovely graph from Naki, 
uh, in, in, at IASA in, in Vienna it tells the, the energy story and it's always a nice sort of scene setter and, and shows our services versus that nonlinear curve, dem rising demand going up. And I, I put this against the, the more recent IPCC report that you've all seen um, with a curve going in exactly the opposite direction. So for those people in the room that are scientists, which is a decent amount of you, you don't normally see curves that go like this and then go like this. But that's, that's what we apparently have, have, have before us. So the, the red is historical and the blue is the future, or could, could be the future. And, and just to say that if we are to get that, we're extraordinarily bad at predicting the future. So uh, there's plenty of people here from, uh, who have worked with the, the EIA or the IEA or, 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 or these various organizations that do a terrific job in general of modeling the system, but no matter how good they are, we are terrible at predicting energy futures, absolutely horrific at it. And so to try to get on a curve that looks like those blue lines is, is not a simple matter. And it has very, very, very little to do with the electricity sector in Colorado. It's, a, it, it's important to us, um, but bending that curve is, you couldn't even see a blip of that, whether we do something on the electricity sector in Colorado. And, and I say that quite confidently. Uh, I, I don't think there'd be much argument on that, but it, it, everyone has the, the acronym OECD in this audience. The, the, the wealthy countries in the world are part of uh, uh, OECD. They're located in a lovely part of Paris, actually, I, I think. Um, if you look on that map on the left, the OECD countries are the, the, the red circles. Those are countries that have uh, flat or decreasing demand over the next couple decades, or likely. And then if you look at the rest of the world or the non-OECD countries, you'll see yellow circles. Those are all the places in the world with growing demand. So if you were going to make a thesis out of this graph, you would say that the energy transition uh, is happening in developing countries. And everything that matters is happening in developing countries. And all of the investment is happening in developing countries. And all of the innovation needs to happen uh, in those systems in order to bend that curve we talked about. Okay, so um, this is a developing country story. And, and so we've decided to have a developing uh, country or rest of the world panel. And if there, this energy transition is to take place, or it is taking place in various ways, there's, there's several contours we can look at uh, about how it's going to impact geopolitics. So we'll touch on some of these. I'm not going to run through the, the, this list, but if we assume that curve is going to bend, if we assume there's going to be a lot more batteries and photovoltaics and oil markets are going to be disrupted and LNG trade is going to change dramatically, um, then there are going to be some geopolitical considerations to take place. And so we're going to hear something about some of those, I believe, from our panelists uh, coming up. So um, we have four panelists. As I said, you could see their, their um, bios. Um, Atul Arya uh, just finished two weeks ago running what is the world's uh, foremost energy uh, conference. It's called Sierra Week. It takes place in Houston every year. Uh, it was an honor to be there, and he's going to give us some insights from that. Uh, uh, prior to that, A Atul uh, was at, uh, at BP for 20 years and is an extraordinary uh, energy mind. Uh, next to him is uh, uh, Professor Amy Schweikert. She's, she's at the Colorado School of Mines and, and works in the nuclear engineering uh, division and is gonna tell us about uh, issues around resilience and maybe even some cool stuff around uh, small modular reactors. Is that the correct acronym? Yeah. And Antoine Hoff uh, is an old friend and, and probably one of the leading uh, oil analysts in the world. He was the chief oil analyst at the International Energy Agency, where he got everything correct the whole time, unlike everyone else, um, and is now at Columbia University's uh, Center on Global Energy Policy. And Barbara uh, Silva, who I've just met, uh, is a 
solar expert and has worked in the field of energy and water and, and renewable energy and is going to talk to us about how the energy transition is playing out in Chile. And if you don't mind, I'm probably just going to go in that order and the floor is yours, Atul. You can sit there. Um, is this on? Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, in the next few minutes, build up on what uh, you just heard from Morgan and, and kind of give you a very high-level picture of where the world's energy and climate system is going. I think the, the simple message which you heard yesterday, and to reiterate, the world needs more energy and less carbon. And that's kind of the real challenge. You know, how do we get more energy? Uh, we already have 7.6 or so billion people, going to be closer to 9 by 2050. So those people are going to need more of everything, you know, not just energy, but things which are used, which energy is used to make, like buildings and food and, and transportation and so on. Uh, so more energy, less carbon. That's kind of the equation to keep in mind. And if you want more energy, you have to decarbonize energy, number one. And number two, you have to make it more efficient, meaning reduce the energy intensity of the GDP. We all know that. So if you can reduce the energy intensity, we are doing well. And if you can reduce the carbon in intensity of that energy, we're doing actually even better. Now, that's kind of the frame. Sort of the bad news is that overall, we are not doing so well. That's the, that's the big challenge. And just to bring this, you know, give some, uh, some facts and figures here. And IEA just actually published their annual view of carbon and energy demand. Last year, energy demand globally grew highest in the last decade, about 2.3%, 2.4%. And that was driven by economic growth worldwide, strong growth. But also, uh, one of the other things we need to keep in mind as the system evolves is what is the impact of climate change, uh, not only on infrastructure and other things we'll talk about, but on energy demand. As the world gets hotter or colder, we're going to consume more energy. And that's one of the leading, sort of the early signs of that was last year. We had some extreme climate events, weather events, I should say, and, and that led to more, more growth and uh, you know, higher energy demand. So we are still a very fossil fuel system, um, and we need to decarbonize that. So in the last decade, when we really started to get decarbonized, really led by electricity sector, as you said, uh, the electricity, the overall decarbonization of the global energy system today is, is going down by 0.25% per year. So we are reducing carbon intensity by 0.25% per year, uh, and that's the data from the last sort of 10 to 15 years, which is extremely slow. If you want to really decarbonize, you have to go much, much faster than that. So, and, and I can come back to some of these points uh, later on. The other important thing is that if you look at any forecast, including IEA, our own from IHS Market, EIA, uh, all of those forecasts in their base scenario has fossil fuels, which are currently about 80%, remain around the same or go slightly less to maybe 70%, 72% by 2050. So that's a very slow decline in the fossil fuel share of energy uh, if you want to really decarbonize the world. Uh, the last point I'll make uh, in the opening is that the, the place where it is easiest to decarbonize is, of course, the electricity sector. And we have done, you know, as always, we will go after the low-hanging fruit, and, and we are doing that. And actually, we are doing pretty well on decarbonizing the electricity sector, not just in the U.S., but but globally, with few exceptions, uh, you know, India being one of those exceptions where it's not really made progress, although they have a big program on uh, renewables. Uh, but the really hard sectors, and you heard this yesterday a little bit, uh, if you were here, uh, we are not really making any progress, including transportation, where there is a lot of hype about electric cars, uh, but there is a broader transportation system uh, which is really not decarbonizing, you know, whether you take uh, yeah, planes and, and, and uh, long distance transport uh, like goods uh, and ships and all of that. But then buildings and industrial sector, which is very difficult to decarbonize. So we have to think about how do we actually accelerate decarbonization of other sectors besides uh, and the power sector. So I'll stop there, Morgan, and I'll come back and share with you what I heard at uh, Sarah Week. Thank you. Good morning. 
So as a Colorado native and somebody who spent more than a decade working in the climate change sector, looking at the impacts that it has on society and particularly on infrastructure, I was really excited to get the opportunity to join this panel. Um, as Morgan mentioned, I don't think that we can talk about the energy transition without acknowledging that there's nearly two billion people around the world that don't currently have access to electricity. And you know, the last day and a half has been an energizing conversation. There's clearly a lot of expertise in this room about what a clean and responsible energy future looks like. But by 2030, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative has pledged that each of these two billion people will in some form have access to electricity by 2030. And that's a huge goal. That says that in the next decade, nearly one in four people on the planet that don't currently have infrastructure need to have that infrastructure built out. And you know, that brings a lot of challenges. I think it makes my job really fun. Um, and I think that it presents an opportunity for Colorado and the experts in this room to lead that conversation. Because there's a real paucity of data in many parts of the world. And the objectives that we set out as being important to the conversation, the data that we are able to provide will guide those investments, both in terms of grid infrastructure, supply chain, and technological choice. And the lock-in that comes from those technology choices will have implications for decades around the world. So a big focus of my work um, since joining the School of Mines has been looking at low-carbon electricity options to electrify the unelectrified. Being in a nuclear engineering program, one of the first things we thought about was, you know, what is the potential of nuclear in these emerging markets? As has also been raised in the past day, there are some big challenges with nuclear. Um, conventional systems are very, very large, over a gigawatt in scale often. They're very expensive, and there are parts of the world that you may not, for a variety of reasons, want to go build lots of nuclear plants. But they're incredibly resilient. Um, you know, they withstand most natural hazard events, and we're one of the only generation forms to run during uh, the hurricane season down in the Gulf Coast. And so, I think for a lot of reasons, um, particularly if we care about climate change, it needs to be part of the conversation. So one of the ways that we thought we should be addressing this is saying, you know, from an objective-oriented approach, that we know there are many issues with climate change, there are issues um, with the cost and the scale of nuclear power plants, how do we address this problem? So in my research group, one of the things that we have done, as, as Morgan alluded to, is work on a micro-reactor design. And we designed a system that is, has an operational history for all of its components to look at the licensing issues that places like New Scale have seen in the past couple of years. We've looked at reducing the size so that the time of construction, the cost of construction, and the risk to um, companies is much, much lower than conventional nuclear. And we also um, designed it to be really small. So we looked at a two megawatt electric size that's fully modular and can be factory built to take advantage of economies of scale, but also to address the question of resilience. Because when you look at resilience of power systems, one of the most vulnerable parts of the system is not the generation technology, it's the grid. So the transmission and distribution infrastructure gets damaged from ice storms, from heavy wind, from hurricanes. And if we're looking at service delivery in the system as a whole, we have to look at the supporting infrastructure that goes with that. Along with transmission and distribution, this includes supply chains. It includes pipelines that deliver our natural gas or other fuels to the stations. And it, deliver, it includes supporting infrastructure, such as roads or ports that are used to transport um, and operate these facilities. And so from a resilience perspective, I think scale is something that we have to be thinking about when we're designing our systems. Um, to the question of how do we electrify the unelectrified, we looked at nuclear power and we think there's some really cool options there. I'd love to talk more if that's something you're curious about. But I also think that it's not the right answer in a lot of places. So we did a study looking at photovoltaics and said coupled to energy storage, what is the possibility of photovoltaics to meet the needs of people in different situations? We took an energy, um, we took a resource perspective and said what are the constraints? What are the available solar irradiance or land use patterns that might affect the ability to build storage? And we found that in many parts of the world, as much as 95% of the population living without visible nighttime light, um, one of the graphs that Morgan showed, could be served by these systems with baseload energy at a capacity factor of 85%. That's huge. But if you want to go and build out solar um, coupled storage systems around the world, there are places where it doesn't make sense. Um, the light you know, is much less. Solar irradiance values go down in the north or the south. 
And when you think about baseload energy, you come into issues of cost and of rare earth mineral extraction when you think about, say, batteries. And so all of this to say that you know, in addressing this question, there's not an easy answer. And I think that when we take a techno-centric approach and say, I have this technology, there's this expertise, and it's really awesome for all these reasons, we lose out on a big part of the conversation. So particularly in the, the face of resilience or climate change or the realities of cost, one of the things that's been really encouraging about this symposium so far is that I think within the research collaboratory here, we have a lot of resources to guide the conversation, not only for Colorado, but for the rest of the world. Um, Mines has a top-ranked nuclear engineering program. We have you know, state-of-the-art facilities. We have experts in all sorts of technologies. Um, and I think that you know, the decisions that we make and the data that we're able to provide can hopefully ground the conversation in the shared objectives and the mutual values that we have. And we can work backwards to figure out what kind of technological portfolio will actually meet the needs of a responsible and a reliable energy future here in Colorado, but also around the world. So. Thank you. OK, good morning. Thanks very much, Morgan, uh, for inviting me. I'm really honored to be on this panel and at this event. Um, so as Morgan said, I represent the incumbent uh, fuel in a way. I focus most of my time on the oil sector. And <clears throat> I try to think how the oil sector will be affected by the transition, but also how it can contribute to the solution, how it can help with the improvement in, in um, climate management and, and so on. Um, so just a few points to, to start. Um, I, I have to echo what Morgan said. The conversation about climate change and about peak demand, which is the way it expresses itself in the oil sector, peak oil demand, tends to be very US-centric and very OECD-centric. Um, most of the forecasts that see peak demand happening in the next few years, happening really soon, uh, basically base their modeling on the U.S. experience, on what we've been experiencing in, in California, particularly on the West Coast. Um, the world is a very wide place, and there's a lot more um, to energy demand, and especially oil demand, than, than the U.S. and even the OECD. Um, a few years ago, the OECD was still most of the oil demand. Today, it's less than 45%, even though the membership uh, of uh, OECD countries keeps increasing. So you really have to think comprehensively about the whole world to try to understand how um, the uh, transition will play out and will affect the, the oil sector. Uh, the key, the, the, the regions where oil demand has been going the fastest and continues to grow at the fastest pace today are the emerging markets, are India, are China, uh, but also many other countries that uh, people focus less on, uh, Indonesia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we see very strong growth there, poorly measured, but nevertheless clearly very, very robust. Uh, these are countries where there's a very strong uh, political will to uh, move towards a cleaner energy fuel mix. Um, no doubt, uh, it's not so much driven by considerations and concerns about the climate. Oftentimes, it's more driven by air quality, water quality, uh, land issues, particularly in China. Uh, or India, where air quality is a huge problem in, in big cities. So there is political will to move away from oil and to move away to cleaner fuels in these countries. Uh, there's a lot of momentum. Uh, China has had the fastest adoption of, of electric vehicles of any country. Uh, there's been very fast growth in, in renewables in China. Nevertheless, growth in dirty fuels, so to speak, is going even faster in China, in these very countries where there's strong will for uh, decarbonization. So you know, what will happen in those countries is going to be key. The ability of the leadership in those countries to execute on their clean fuel policies uh, is untested, unproven, uh, and will be key to shaping the future. So you really have to look at the, the, whole, the whole spectrum there. Um, the other thing uh, I would say is um, if you decarbonize one country, you might actually increase the carbonization of another. So if you move the transportation uh, fleet in the US away from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles towards electric vehicles, you might not actually get rid of the uh, ICE vehicles. You might just move them to export them to Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa and get very strong 
you know, uh, oil consumption trends in those countries. So again, it's, it's a whole, you have to have a comprehensive approach. Now, these comprehensive approach, these need to be holistic across region, geographically, is also true across sectors. Uh, just because you decarbonize one sector doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be a plus for the climate as a whole. If you clean up uh, transportation, for example, you might actually make power generation more dirty. An example uh, which is very current is the, the um, efforts to clean up sulfur emissions from ships that are currently underway. Uh, in January next year, uh, there's a huge uh, step in uh, emission uh, uh, permits for ships. Ships worldwide will have to move from 3.5% sulfur emissions to 0.5%. It's a massive step. So this is basically uh, expected to result in a huge shift from dirty fuels like uh, residual fuel oil to uh, cleaner ones, distillate fuel or low sulfur, very low sulfur fuel oils uh, that don't exist today but are, that are being developed by, by companies to address the new standards. Uh, but the dirty fuel might not just fall off the map. We're actually likely to see it come back in power generation in countries that had been moving away from it. An example is Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Persian Gulf that had been moving their power generation system from dirty fuels to natural gas, which was an improvement for the climate, now facing the prospect of vast amounts of dirty fuels being pushed away from the shipping sector, they're rethinking those plans and saying, why should we spend money developing gas, power generation capacity, and, and developing gas production domestically, or importing expensive gas, expensive gas, when we can have this very cheap, dirty fuel, distressed, looking for market outlet and get our, power, our electricity that we need much cheaper in this fashion. So you, you have to look at the, at the uh, complex, at the energy system across sectors in a comprehensive way, and that makes the forecast very, very difficult. When we, when we look, uh, and I would like here to, to uh, pick up on, on what uh, both Atul and, and uh, Morgan said, when we look at the energy mix today, at the demand trends today, and when we look at where we want to go, uh, there's a dramatic contrast, and many of my colleagues, oil forecasters, uh, sound very schizophrenic these days, speak from both corners of their mouth. Because if you look at where we need to be by 2050 or 2040 or 2030, we need to move away from oil really fast. But the trend in oil consumption in the last few years has never been so strong. We have, we've never added more oil uh, consumption uh, than we have in, in just the last few years. The trend shows no sign of slowing down. So the, there's a contrast between forecasts based on current trends and forecasts based on aspirational views of where we need to be. Uh, it's interesting, the, the International Energy Agency, where I used to, to work, publishes a, a major book every year, The World Energy Outlook, which is used as a benchmark for, by many analysts to uh, shape their own views of the future. Uh, the Rio, as we call it, goes for peer review before the publication, uh, which is not really peer review, but it goes out to many experts and opinion makers uh, for feedback, and that feedback tends to be uh, then uh, integrated into the final product. So usually the Rio represents a consensus view of the industry, a very middle of the road view of where we're going. But when it comes to oil consumption, it's, it's become an outlier. Uh, the, the WIO continues to see very strong growth in oil demand until 2040, until the end of the forecast period, whereas the consensus among, even among uh, major oil companies has moved in a different way and now uh, acknowledges the, the transition and, and expects peak demand within the forecast period by 2025, 2030, 2035, depending on the companies. It's a difference of view that doesn't really represent major disagreement on the, on the needs or uh, where we have to go. It's really based on different methodologies. The WIO forecast is data-driven, is inherently conservative because it selects for continuity, whereas the more, fo more aspirational forecast are inherently looking for disruption and looking, uh, working backwards from where we need to be, uh, trying to figure out how we're gonna get there. So there's a, there's a very wide wedge, uh, wedge in those forecasts. Well, that, another point I would like to make is part of this discrepancy is partly rooted in the uh, reality that we understand demand, oil demand today very poorly. Uh, we understand it to some degree in OECD countries, but even there, 
not so well. We don't really get it in non-OC countries because the data collection uh, capacity is just not there. So we have a very poor view of how we use oil today. We know pretty much how much oil we use, how uh, we do use it, in what sectors, in, w in which ways, even in which geographies or location is not that clear. So a lot of my time is spent these days on trying to improve the data quality, the understanding uh, of our own sector, oil sector based on the available data. The good news is that uh, there's a lot of new technologies that can be uh, leveraged, that can be channeled to improve our understanding of, of oil consumption trends using satellite imagery, using geolocation, using social media. Uh, we're making huge strides uh, and we're using those techniques both at Columbia University and in the private sector to try to get a, a better picture of where things are. Having a stronger understanding of consumption trends today will enable us to identify opportunities for displacement and for investment in new technologies, new cleaner energies in a more efficient way than we would otherwise. Um, so in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where there's a lot of interest in granting energy access to people who don't have it, being able to identify through geolocation and through uh, satellite imagery where the needs are, where the biggest impact might be, where there's the most diesel consumption used today for power generation that goes completely under the radar because it's usually countered in IA statistics as trucking demand, uh, will help uh, make investment dollars more efficient uh, towards uh, the transition to a cleaner fuel mix. Um, two last points. Uh, part of the transition uh, is not only about moving away from uh, fossil fuels, but it's also about making sure that this transition away from fossil fuels is going to be orderly and not disorderly. One risk uh, that goes along with the uh, expectations of peak demand and, and the transition is that there's not going to be enough investment in oil production in the short term to make sure that we have just enough to move away smoothly from oil towards uh, cleaner fuel mix. So there's a lot of concerns among investors about stranded assets, about the idea that investment in the oil sectors will lose money because you move away from oil. Those concerns carry a risk that capital for the oil sector is going to be too expensive and uh, uh, appetite for, uh, risk appetite for oil assets will, can, will go down and that we're going to be running out of oil supply capacity, driving a huge increase in oil prices and causing the transition to, in a way, accelerate, but in a very disorderly fashion and at the huge costs to uh, the global economy. So that's, that's a concern. And the last concern is what this all means for oil companies. Uh, oil companies are under huge pressure from investors to demonstrate that they're prepared for the transition, that they are managing their climate risks, and that they're diversifying, but they're not very well equipped to do so. It's a very big challenge for them to, to engineer that transition. And in fact, it's not so clear that a policy of diversification for oil companies is so effective and so, so profitable. Uh, the expertise of oil companies is not necessarily in renewables. Uh, they don't necessarily have a competitive advantage moving away from the oil sector towards other, other sectors. Some are uh, trying to leverage their unique uh, skill sets to, and apply them to renewable sectors. One example would be Equinor, the Norwegian oil company, which is uh, uh, an expert in uh, deep water uh, platforms for oil production. They're leveraging those skills to develop um, offshore wind farms that are very, um, currently very expensive, but also very promising in terms of the uh, amount of power they can deliver. So just a few thoughts to, to start. I have my own thoughts. Hello, uh, my name is Barbara Silva. I'm the CEO of Atamos Tech, which is Atacama Models and System Technology Consortium. Well, uh, this is a project located in Chile. Chile is an emerging country. We need more energy than carbon. Uh, we cannot have uh, nuclear because we are very seismic. We are famous for our earthquakes, and it creates a lot of uh, issues with the community. And um, we have... Uh, a lot of investments uh, regarding infrastructure. What's happening in Chile right now is that we now can say that we have the best solar resource all around the world. 
And this resource is located in the north of the country, where we also have the mining sector, which is copper and lithium right now. So we have a huge combination with solar, with sun, copper, and lithium. What we're trying to, to create is an ecosystem that can give us the answer for the transition from fuel to um, uh, a more green matrix, because we have everything there. What we're trying to figure it out is how. And um, this project, the one that I'm uh, running, is uh, to develop like a first step on a collabora collaborative way with the private sector and the R&D centers, both national and international, because we don't know how to do it, basically. <laughs> so, because um, there are several equations that we need to uh, answer. And um, Chile realized that uh, putting effort and money answering these questions in a scientific way, uh, it will create um, more technology-based companies, startups, and we will, um, we will have a more uh, sustainable mining sector. We will increase their competitiveness. And um, if we are able to create technologies that are sustainable and will reduce the, the carbon footprint, the water footprints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we will be more competitive all around the world. So um, we think that uh, solar energy in this case, both photovoltaics and CSP, we have a huge project that everybody's expecting and the end of it is Cerro de Minador, it's in the north of the country, and everybody's expecting to lower the prices of solar, and this uh, decreasing the prices will allow to research more and have more resources, and creating like a virtuous circle of innovation and uh, where everybody can benefit from it, from the community, from the R&D, and the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have uh, Atomosec, one of the biggest uh, R&D projects, apply R&D projects in solar, and right now we are having a huge standard for a clean energy institute, and I invite you to all to see the um, the conditions of the tender, because we understand that this is a collaborative exercise. We need everybody. Uh, we expect uh, Chile, we always talk about Chile as a platform for Latin America, and we think that's uh, the right uh, way to do it. Uh, we have uh, another countries that can benefit from what we're doing right now. Uh, we are located in South America. Chile is the most developed country in the region, and we would like to help or uh, Peru, Colombia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to gain more experience and to gain, uh, to jump up this train that we understand is not gonna stop, which we are very happy about it. And um, the transition would be a um, more holistic way, as Antoine said. Uh, we are working uh, very closely with the private sector we think the industry should be involved from the beginning, and because of, um, not just because of get our stuff in the market, but because we believe that we need to build a more long-term relationship with the industry. Um, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's the same thing in Colorado, but in Chile, uh, the industry said that the professors and the R&D are only worried about papers and stuff like that and get funding. And the, the researchers said that the industry are only worried about the numbers, uh, you know, the EBITDA and how they're going to get to the market. And we need a, like, a middle, like a middle institution that can bring them together and create like a more um, holistic methodology of how to work together. And um, that the invitation is open. Uh, Chile is uh, looking for new talent and we're working, Atomos is worried about, uh, we, have, we are a very diverse group of people. We have more women than men working, which is something really, really rare. Uh, it's, um, there's so many things to do in so many areas, and I think the goal is common for all of us, having a more sustainable uh, industrial sector that is aware of the sustainability of the processes, and that actually we need innovation, we need to develop technologies to do the same, the, the same thing in a different way. Because in, I don't know, um, not because we are located in the desert, we have to abuse the desert, right? 
We are located in a place where we can uh, create models, uh, new methodologies, as an MBA example for the rest of the world on how to do things in a, again, collaborative way, looking for innovation and, and research. So can we thank the panelists in the typical uh, way? Thank you. So we, we've saved quite a bit of time for uh, questions and answers. Um, I think you, I, I, I like many of you go to uh, far too many energy conferences, and I, but I think here you have a really diverse and rich set of experiences and knowledge so we could draw on um, everything from small nuclear reactors to what was said at uh, Zero Week to, to how EVs are gonna impact demand. And the last one, and I think uh, Maury and Governor Ritter, I think uh, you just heard the best uh, business case for the collaboratory you could, you could find in, 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 in what Barbara just, just said there. So uh, I think we have a roaming mic. Uh, so if you'd like to um, ask a question, uh, just so you know, a question is a statement that has a question mark at the end. You don't, you don't have to raise your voice at the end, but you can at least uh, use that question mark rather than make a comment, if you don't mind. And if you would tell us who you are, um, not spiritually, but just where you work, that would be great. Where, where were you born? Oh, you sure. start there. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Madhav Vicharya. I'm with uh, ARPA-E, and I appreciate all the comments you've made. And my question is specifically to uh, Antoine. You made a very interesting comment about the fact that decarbonizing one sector doesn't mean you're decarbonizing at all. And when you look at all of the studies that come out on decarbonization, there is this projection of, well, we're doing it well for electricity, and by extension, we should be able to do it for, for everything. So I have two specific questions, going to what Morgan asked. First is, why are there no studies that look holistically at, at the entire world, all sectors, uh, I mean, imagine we have enough computational power to do that. So that's the first question, why is that not happening? And the second is, if we were to do that, would we find that there is a certain amount of fossil energy through oil and coal and, uh, and, and gas that still needs to be there? So there is a natural floor below which we simply cannot decarbonize, regardless of whatever silver bullet is invented. Thank you. And Maury, can I collect, uh, say, two more questions and then we'll... We have one here and one over there. As you like. Okay. Do you want them right now? Those yes, questions? Please. You can remember yeah, these? Two That's more, great. yeah. We'll remember. You're smart. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Rahman Budiarto from uh, Center for Energy Studies, Universitas Kachamada, Indonesia. Uh, uh, my question goes to the Antonio Hoff and Amish Shaikart. It is true that Indonesia has a uh, strong political will. Uh, to accelerate the uh, use of uh, green energy. For example, and this is our questions. Uh, my country, in my country in Indonesia, the coal will still play a role, huge role, until 2025, about 60 to 70 percent in the energy mix. And also, although we start already the nuclear power plant development, the first nuclear power plant developments, there is still no green light, political green light for the first nuclear power plant. And then also, we, just example, we also uh, try to accelerate the use of uh, palm oil as a fuel, a biofuel in the domestic markets uh, due to, for example, the ban for the uh, European market. My question is to both of you, how to accelerate the uh, renewable energy uh, use in Indonesia because in 2025 we have uh, target to until 25 percent, but nowadays uh, 2019 the energy mix rules of energy renewable energy is still 12 to 15 percent. And how to accelerate the nuclear power plant, for example, in a political comfortable ways? Thank you very much. Okay, two easy questions. Let's collect one more. Thank you. Yes, we have plenty of time, don't we, Dr. Brazilian? Who, Thank you, who had a question? Great. Hi, good morning. My name is Roseanne Casey. I'm independent consultant. Um, this morning we've been talking about international markets more and also about the underserved, the vast quantities of people without power. Um, 
such a great conversation last two days about all the technical solutions to all of this, which are readily available, but we haven't really talked so much about governance, and I appreciate the policy aspect. Can you comment on any positive examples of where governance is being addressed, particularly in the developing world? This is the primary challenge of implementing most of the projects that should be done or most of the transition that should be done, and it's the hardest nut to crack, so I appreciate comments on that. Yeah, we'll crack the governance problem. No, I, I think we're capable of that. So, um, yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we go in reverse order? And if you want to tackle any of those questions, from large scale modeling to what Indonesia should energy transition to governance, please. Well, in Chile, the, um, once we realize the benefits of innovation, technology, and stuff like that. Uh, we started looking for champions. You have the former governor from the video. We are looking for that kind of champions and because they are the ones that are related with the community. But I think the most important thing is that the numbers that you have to convince the people that there will be benefit from this public policy. And um, once they understand how the GDP is affect, how many more employers you're gonna have, a more sophisticated employee you're gonna have, they understand it. And um, the champions are the ones that carry away the message of we need a public policy that, that is um, uh, modern and it will help the people and will help everybody. And always in a more um, sophisticated and holistic way. Once the kids understand that the sun can benefit them or they can understand how the technology works, it's easier. But uh, you need to have, uh, we've been, working with champions in all the different sectors, mining sector, energy sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are convinced that uh, the public policy is the way to do this. And how to concentrate um, the, the, the efforts, the public efforts, especially for funding, on more specific niche or more specific um, technologies or sectors where you can actually create more value. But the champions are really important, especially in Chile, which is a developing country. You have to have like a, the champions could be a governor or it could be a soccer player or anybody. As long as we have a sense that go solar, <laughs> we have that kind of uh, campaigns and stuff like that. From the kids to the bigger picture. So that's how Chile has done it. Th thanks, Barbara. And we have a governor who was a professional soccer player, I, I, I believe, which is lucky. Um, Antoine, please. Okay, the, well, <clears throat> easy questions, as you said. Yeah. Um, holistic modeling, I think it's, everybody's trying to do it. Uh, it's very difficult to do because basically um, modeling tends to be based on past trends. And in order to get to where we want to be with the transition, we really have to break the mold and to um, invent new, new modes of uh, energy, new energy systems, new mode of energy development. Uh, <clears throat> if, we, if we rely on experience, you know, oil consumption is driven by uh, economic growth and population growth. And on current trends, on current forecasts of population growth and economic growth, uh, we're heading towards disaster and really rapidly growing all demand. Uh, in order to avoid that, we really rely on emerging markets inventing new modes of development and leapfrogging the stages of hydrocarbon developments that more mature economies have gone through before them. Uh, we need to go directly from uh, you know, traditional biofuels to uh, modern uh, uh, biofuels. Uh, we need to uh, skip over types of mobilities that uh, more developed countries have gone through and so on. So this is not easy to model. A lot of people are uh, resorting to scenario exercises instead of modeling, uh, but there's obviously limits to all of these exercises. And what I think is lacking in many forecasts is uh, an effort to take into account feedback uh, loops uh, unintended consequences from policies, uh, rebound effects, you know, uh, having a more efficient uh, system, for, for example, for transportation, 
doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to use less fuel. It could mean that we're going to use more fuels because we're going to create new demand. Uh, in Mexico, as in many other countries, there's been a, a program to replace all fridges with more efficient refrigerators. It hasn't really decreased the consumption. It has increased it because people now have efficient refrigerators in the kitchens, but keep the old fridge in the garage for beer. Uh, so you use a lot more energy this way. So there's a lot of unintended consequences, feedback effects, uh, rebound effects, and so on, that have to be, I think, taken into account, even though they're not particularly pleasant to consider today. Uh, will there be oil remaining? Yes, I mean, there are sectors where it's very hard to imagine displacing oil. Uh, it's not impossible, but very hard. Uh, the key sector is petrochemicals. I think there's a very wide consensus that oil demand for petrochemicals and plastics will continue to increase and will actually accelerate. Uh, interestingly, a lot of oil producing countries like Saudi Arabia and others are investing now a lot of their uh, dollars in building up petrochemical capacity including in advanced petrochemicals, new plastics, uh, with the view that the transition will actually increase demand for new materials, uh, electric vehicles, self-driven vehicles, we no longer need to be very heavy because accident risks will, uh, are supposed to be reduced, uh, so there will be more demand for lighter materials like new plastics uh, that uh, will, in, in that sense, increase demand for oil from that sector. So there, there are areas of oil demand that look very difficult to, to, to get rid of. Um, and yeah, to, in the transportation sector, electric planes look like a fairly distant prospect today. So I think jet fuel uh, planes uh, still remain what everybody is putting in their forecast. Uh, other things that uh, emerging uh, governments or governments in emerging countries can do to accelerate the transition. Uh, sure, and I think they're doing it. In India, there's many policies that are very effective, like developing the rail sector to replace trucks and moving the rail sector from diesel to, uh, to electricity. Um, there's many steps. I think really to be effective, uh, an energy policy cannot be dissociated from other policies, from social policies, from urban policies, urban planning, and so on. So it's a very, very tall order. It, it really calls for a very comprehensive, bold vision, not only of what the fuel mix will look like, but what our societies will look like, our modes of living will look like. Thanks, Antoine. Amy, yeah. Great. So I appreciate your question. I think it's always helpful to ground these kinds of conversations in real examples because, you know, ideally, if we got the chance to just rebuild our entire electric system or our grid, we might do it differently. Um, but looking at the geopolitical will, the intention of governments to implement energy security, clean energy technologies, um, you know, it, it, it is what we're thinking about. And so one of the ways that I, you know, can't say to solve this problem, but would say has seen a lot of traction. Um, I'm not a nuclear engineer by background. I came from a systems engineering and an international development background into a nuclear engineering program. And what brought me there is the fact that when we think about climate change or clean energy transitions, I think nuclear has to be part of the conversation. And there's an intriguing, um, we heard a little bit yesterday about integrated and hybrid systems. And when we think about baseload technologies, when we think about international politics um, and the will to move towards cleaner energy transitions, I think it's really helpful to ground the conversation in we want to move towards clean technologies. And instead of competing, should it be nuclear or should it be renewables, should we displace oil and gas? One of the ways to hopefully bring more people to the table and find a better solution, maybe move forward some of the political issues, address some of the governance challenges, would be to say, we want to meet these targets and work backwards and say, how do we work together to give, you know, maybe in this case, nuclear is a good baseload technology, but renewables have a huge role to play in energy demand. I know in Indonesia, one of the big challenges is natural hazard events. You guys have a lot of hurricanes come through, and that affects your infrastructure. And so something like resilience as a goal, that your energy you know, sector can withstand high winds and hurricanes multiple times per season, that should factor into how you're valuing your energy system, and it should factor into how you're building it, where you're siting these, um, where you're siting these plants, how your supply lines are going to work in your transmission systems. And you know, far from being the perfect answer, um, hopefully, I think it's a new way of framing the conversation, that it can be grounded in these objectives, and you know, hopefully move past competition towards a little bit more of collaboration. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Atul, you have the floor. I, I also wouldn't mind, in addition to the questions, if you would give us a, 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 a few highlights of what you heard the most at Zero Week or 
since you have the pulse on that. All right, I'll be quick on the question. I just want to go back to the issue of forecasting and different models. Uh, I think it's a really important issue. And the reason there are differences, obviously, is because people are making different assumptions about the future. And, and the biggest difference in the assumptions is how quickly technology is going to progress, you know, say, for example, storage or other renewable technologies. Uh, and, and, and say electric cars, you know, all the different technologies, how quickly they will, they will accelerate or, or scale up. Uh, one thing we do in my company is we compare uh, forecasts from many different organizations, IEA, our own, EIA, and the various oil companies uh, doing their different scenarios. And, and in pretty much every forecast, including those from Greenpeace, uh, you know, they, there is a fossil fuel component, even if you go to 2050, the world just cannot, as Antoine said, cannot run without fossil fuel. So I think there's a general consensus on that. The real difference is how much of that fossil fuel will be there, you know, what is the mix of oil, gas, and coal in particular uh, overall. So I think that's where the big differences are. Uh, I think it's a good area for research, maybe in places like Colorado, to make these assumptions more transparent and really then question them. So one thing we do is we look at what is happening? What are the key mileposts we can see? So if there's a forecast to a drop in, say, price for uh, storage or batteries, uh, more specifically, are we hitting those numbers? Are we hitting those targets so that we can then accelerate that to say, you know, where the future will look like? Uh, clearly more, more to be done. Coming back to Sarah Week, I will, I will um, share a few things. One is that I think there is generally the industry, energy industry more broadly, has been pretty good at you know, using technology. And we saw that at Sarah Week, and you were there. Uh, we created a new space called the Technology Agora, where we bring in new players, new companies, all the way from startups to the very big players. Uh, and we started only three years back. It has kind of grown by a factor of 10 in the last three years. And it's really because there's so much technology happening, and that's kind of the optimism I would have is, uh, uh, you know, and I heard yesterday this interesting comment that can the energy sector, uh, sector transform at the pace of software? I, I don't quite think quite so, but, but skill, still we can see that happening uh, with very large companies with a lot of resources coming in and trying to disrupt the business, you know, the Microsofts, Google, Amazons of the world, but also very small players trying to use data and analytics to, to change the energy system. So I think that's a space for us to all watch and learn more about. Uh, a couple of other things quickly to say. One is I didn't hear here yesterday or uh, so far is this whole issue of gas as a uh, you know, transition uh, fuel. And there are a lot of discussion about how gas and renewables can partner. Can there be a partnership between gas and renewables? I personally think there is what we call in our firm uh, efficient frontier depending upon a very local set of conditions on price and regulation and, and uh, targets, you could have gas and renewables as very good partners to, you know, for the future. Uh, so there's a big optimism, I think a lot of optimism around that. Uh, the other one which surprised me was, and there was some discussion here around carbon capture. You know, we've tried carbon capture many times. I personally worked on it for about 15 years. Uh, and, but there seems to be new enthusiasm around carbon capture. I think time will tell. But one thing is very clear, if you want to solve the global climate problem, we are going to need to deal with coal. And, and there was a discussion with the governor and, and Chris, uh, Representative Hansen, uh, around that here. Uh, we can't just, just you know, shut down those coal plants. That'll be very expensive. And you're looking at the microcosm of that problem here in Colorado. Think about you know, shutting all the coal-fired power in China or, or India. It's just practically not feasible. Uh, and any technology to capture that carbon, whether it's direct air capture or, or uh, carbon capture and then sequestering, uh, was a big big thing. The last thing I would say is uh, transportation, and particularly batteries. We had a lot of discussion about batteries, and this is where assumptions become very important. If you take the very high penetration of EV forecast, then you go back and say, well, how much batteries will we need for that? And you assume very much you know, decline in price and efficiency, you still need to make those batteries. And you look at the supply chain, there are some very significant challenges around the battery supply chain, uh, which we heard a lot about at Sarah Week. So you know, just a flavor of things we heard. That's terrific. So now we have, uh, well, you've heard a lot of, I think, really important parts of the discussion around the energy transition. We still have a few minutes uh, to go. Everything from how developing countries are addressing this and taking leadership positions in it to 
the reality that there's been very strong growth in the oil sector, and, and even yesterday the headline in most newspapers was uh, Saudi Aramco's uh, profits. You, you, you could call those rents, but in any case, they, the, the profits were extraordinarily high. And, and I think what Amy said there on not just having a technocratic approach is exceedingly important. Uh, we opened this event with Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and, and m many of us in the room as technocrats or as scientists uh, tend to go that way. But uh, in the energy system, if we don't think about it as a system, we will uh, not get this right. And, and finally, just the plug for Sierra Week, it's an extraordinary event. And, what, and that point that Atul made about the digitalization, not just the digitalization, but the tech technology aspects becoming sort of the biggest topic of the world's biggest oil and gas event, uh, I think is really important, especially for the young people in the audience who, who, who are going to be the leaders in, in, in those fields. So we have time for maybe one, one or two more questions. Sure. Morning, Bill Leedy, the Leedy Foundation in Alaska. Two quick questions. First, are we mistaken in assuming that the electricity and the electricity system, call it the grid, is the necessary and best and optimal way of moving CO2 emission-free energy around in a firm fashion? As the lady from uh, Mines said, if we were reinventing the electricity grid, we might invent something entirely different. And over 50 CEOs have joined the Hydrogen uh, Council saying that hydrogen, maybe anhydrous ammonia are the way to do it. Secondly, are we just one technical breakthrough away from unlocking the silver bullet for, for renewable energy, which is deep, hot, dry rock geothermal? If we could only bore deep enough, cheap enough, do we have ubiquitous, cheap, benign energy available all over the world? Thank you. Okay, how about one more, Maury, and we'll, we'll try that. Hi, Ellen Morris from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Columbia University. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is uh, access to finance and investment. And I'm thinking investment not in Brazil, India, China, but more investment in least developed countries, which are the 47 poorest countries in the world. And that's an aspect I just wanted to maybe throw out there to the panel. Where do you see investment flows happening? How will access to finance happen in these least developed countries? Okay, investments in LDCs, silver bullets, and hydrogen. Anybody? I, I can do the hydrogen and, uh, and the other uh, follow-up question. So um, there is a lot of enthusiasm about hydrogen, and just if you go by the number of sessions at Sarah Week, we had zero three years back, one last year, and we had five this year. So clearly, we are not yet at peak hydrogen, but we are getting there. Um, uh, but I think the hydrogen multi-prong approach, the biggest challenge, as I see it, is the cost of generating hydrogen. I think that still remains the big, you know, one big challenge. And one idea out there is that if you have excess renewable energy, you know, which is not being used at, at peak periods, could we convert that into hydrogen and store it and use it when we need it? I think early days, but clearly. And hydrogen for heat, I think, is a, is a really important pathway. Transportation will be equally important, but heat is where uh, I think it will be, it'll be really important. What was the other second part? Yeah, uh, uh, silver bullets. Geothermal. Dark yeah, ge dark. geothermal, actually. Yeah. So, geothermal um, has a lot of potential, but the scale wise, its overall energy mix, you know, it's, it's really can't be a. That, because there are, we know where geothermal resources are around the world. They are being exploited. Even if we exploited every single resource, it's not going to solve the global problem. And the other issue with geothermal is it's only in specific areas. and vast part of the world where we need energy, we haven't been able to exploit the geothermal. Maybe we can talk offline. Go ahead, Amy. So just to make a comment on the finance question, because I think it's incredibly relevant. Um, one of the projects that is ongoing right now in kind of the international development sector um, is looking at ways to bridge the conversation between groups like you know, international finance, um, you know, global development, uh, banks, and different groups that are working in that area and translating the engineering, um, some of the project, you know, the resilience or the sustainability of a project into a common language so that projects can actually be evaluated by insurance markets or, you know, global banks um, 
to compare different projects on a similar scale. And so um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now with the World Bank is actually looking at what would it look like to develop a framework indicator that can help rapidly inform and sort of prioritize projects and then allow you to drill down into some of the really detailed components that need to be there, but in an effort exactly for that reason, to say big development dollars have been pledged, lofty goals have been set, and to meet any of those goals, we need to have a common way to be talking about this and evaluating these in a robust way. Anybody else? Yes. I think one of the most important things that we have to mention is education. We need to educate people in the most, uh, all level, all countries, because um, now we are among pairs. When we talk about LCOE or business models or everything, we all understand what we are talking about. But we need to educate people. I think more than investments, we need to invest in educate people so they can understand what we're doing and what they're going to be their benefits. And I'm talking about kids, preschool, and then from up to PhDs, and start doing things in a very completely different way. So more than investments, I think the investment should be in educated people that they can understand and the benefits of what we're doing. And in the interest of uh, staying on time, and I want to let uh, Barbara's be the last words, especially as this is a symposium uh, comprised of uh, educational uh, institutions, so that's a n nice way to end the panel. I, I want to thank the panelists as well as Maury and uh, Governor Ritter for, for having us here and for setting this terrific symposium together. Thank you. Thank you.